open with uh, scripture that you uh, don't have to turn to because it's very familiar. Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. I was only supposed to read the first three verses, but I I couldn't stop. (laughs) That's that's like one, you know. Anyway. Uh, So last week, uh, question 24, we talked about what is sin, and I thought a lot less people would show up today because we've been talking about sin for like weeks now, (laughs) but you're still coming, aren't you? Uh, And the question was, what is sin? And we talked about the the negative sin, which is a lack of conformity to God's law. I'm not doing something he's called me to do. And also the positive sin, which is that's the the line he drew for me, and I'm just going to transgress it, I'm going to step over it. Uh, And that could be unintentional as well. This week, we're getting a little more specific about the effects of sin. Uh, So question 25 is on your sheet, and this is our catechism question today. And it reads like this. Wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate wherein to man fell? The sinfulness of that estate wherein to man fell consisteth in the guilt of Adam's first sin, the want of that righteousness wherein he was created, and the corruption of his nature, whereby he is utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite unto all that is spiritually good, and wholly inclined to all evil, and that continually, which is commonly called original sin, and from which do proceed all actual transgressions. All right. What are some key words and phrases of this catechism question? You can, you can elaborate some if you want. What are some key words, key phrases to get our minds thinking about what's going on here? Original sin. Original sin. Just mark the word. Mike stole the easiest one. Yeah. Original. <laughs> Made opposite of all that is spiritually good. Okay. Opposite to all good. Well, how do we imply glory? Inclined to evil. And continually. Continually. I don't think about that. That's kind of scary. It's calm. Say it again. It's calm. It's common. It's common? Okay. It says that he was disabled, which means once God removes his presence from you, that's all that's left. Mm-hmm. Okay. Estate as well. Estate, yes. That's good. Actual transgression. Aha, uh-huh. okay. Anything else? All right. 
We remain opposite to all good. We are corrupt. The corruption of his nature is one thing we could have probably wrote. In, wholly inclined. Wholly inclined to all evil. Alright. Let us read, as we read Ephesians 2. Uh, you can turn in your Bibles to Ephesians once again. I will read some of the scripture references for this and a couple from Ephesians that, that aren't on there. I figured I would just stick to Ephesians. So you have the and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Famous passage. That's pretty clear. It's pretty clear. Also Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, will give us some insight on this question of the sinfulness and depravity of man. 417. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God, which you can think about the garden at that point, right? Alienated from the presence of God, from the life of God after the fall. Because of their ignorance that is in them, the fall made us ignorant. Due to their hardness of heart. Why? Because your heart is hard. See? They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality. Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's an interesting phrase. They're greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Uh, Also, Ephesians 5, 7. There's a really amazing phrase here that I've always thought about. That, uh, that you'll see. Uh, verse 7, 5 7. Therefore, do not, be, uh, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Isn't that interesting? He says, It's not that you were in darkness. You were, in, you were darkness. You, you were darkness itself, but now you are light. You are light in the Lord. All right, let's go ahead and dive into our questions, and we'll bring up some other scriptures as we go along, um, of course. Uh, What are the two principal kinds of sin? And, you know, most of these questions are referring to things in the question, in the catechism question itself, so you can kind of look there um, for for the answer. But what, what are the two principal kinds of sin there are mentioned? Thoughts and deeds. Original sin is one, and what did you say, Hank? Is there thoughts and deeds? Thoughts and deeds, no, but the, I mean, you, you can sin in both, that is true. Yeah, two things. You can sin with your thoughts and you can sin with your deeds. Right. What we're getting at is original sin being one, and then there's another one it's mentioned, yeah. Actual transgressions. Aha! Actual transgressions. Um, so those are the two principal kinds of sin. So, uh, it's not on your sheet, but I do want to ask, what do those mean? First, what's, an, what's original sin referred to? Sin that Adam created when he fell from the grace of God. And the sin we inherited from Adam in our nature. Okay. We were born in sin, original sin. Okay. Actual transgressions. What does that mean? You go out and steal it. Right. But it's important to know that by saying actual transgressions, uh, and, and uh, describing that with original sin, it's not that original sin isn't actual. It's not that it's not real. It's not that you're not really born in sin. You are, uh, but that's your inherited sin. Your actual sin is when you start sinning in life. Yeah. You can say that original sin is the root and actual transgression is the fruit. That's really good. Yeah. Well, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The root and the, and the rotten fruit. That's good. Exactly. All right, what righteousness did mankind lose by the fall? All righteousness. Right? All all of his righteousness. But let's continue. What righteousness? I won't just give you the answer. What righteousness did mankind lose by the fall? A little more specific than that, but you're not wrong, Brother Bruce. We were created in righteousness. 
Right, right. That's that's what it's getting at. The the righteousness in that which he was created. To and that's to say, not his own. It wasn't his own righteousness. It was original righteousness. You see, original righteousness, original sin. He was born in righteousness. Now, because of his sin, we're born in sin. So it wasn't a righteousness of his own. Uh, besides the guilt of Adam's first sin and the loss of original righteousness, what other evil resulted from the fall? There's a lot of stuff we can talk about here. But... What other evil resulted from the fall? Or, or what was the effect of the fall on mankind furthermore? The ground was cursed. Okay, that's good. The creation itself was cursed and fell. Mm-hmm. That's good, right. And now the... Creation is groaning, awaiting for the revealing of the sons of God. So it's it's not doing well. It's groaning. It's awaiting this day of resurrection. Yeah. Is that for all forms of misery? You know, so does that bring about the misery? But that's the effects of it. Mm-hmm. Right. That's good. Um, think, let's think a little more general too. What what is the what was the effect of sin? Of, of the fall on each individual. Death. Death. Bingo. Good. And, and something else. It's a very popular word or phrase in uh, reform circles. Uh, the total depravity of, of man. We have, uh, our natures have been corrupted. We've been depraved in heart and, and love sin. Rather than God. Another thing to add. Um, does, any, does anyone have anything else to add there before I go on? You're not wrong. Go for it. Also, loss of communion with God is very important to recognize. Uh, the, in the garden, we had full communion of God. When we fell, we lost that communion with Him. And that's really the whole story of the Bible. Is God communing with His people. Trying to get back there. Right in the Messiah. First you have the tabernacle system where God's presence was with the people. Then the temple. And then Jesus, the true temple, has come here. And then the Spirit being poured out onto the church so that we are the temple of the living God. See, God's presence has dwelled with His people to, so that we look forward to the day where we are not quite back in the garden because it's going to be far better, but in a place like the garden where His presence is, is there like it was then. Uh, the, the city in Ezekiel is called the God who is there. Or the, or the name of that city from this day forth shall be the Lord is there. The Lord is there. There you go. The Lord is there. Amen. All right. What is the extent of the corruption of nature that resulted from the fall? The extent of the corruption. Did it corrupt all of you? Totally. Totally. Right. Now, what does total depravity mean? And what doesn't it mean? Can't help ourselves. Can't, Can't help ourselves, okay. It doesn't mean other depravity where everything we do is as evil as it possibly could be. Right, right. That's, that's, really, that's really important. That's something I wanted to point out. I think we, when you first hear the doctrine, uh, many people tend to think that is what it means. And some people hear us saying that, although that's not what we're saying. We're not saying utter depravity, that every human being is as bad as they possibly could be at all times. That would be a scary... Every facet of man is corrupted. Right. Instead, what it means is every faculty has been corrupted. The whole entire man has been corrupted with sin. Everything is corrupted. There's not a part of you that hasn't been corrupted by sin. But you can be worse. Hey, pagans can be worse. Right? But uh, thanks be to God, he restrains evil often. Often. And when he doesn't, it's very, very scary. Um, how are... Um, here's something that's not on your sheet. How, how, are, how is the denial of the doctrine of total depravity, how does it affect other doctrines? And, and what's sort of the, the result of, of denying this kind of clear teaching of Scripture that we were dead in our sins and trespasses. 
if you deny it over the property, it pulls out the book that you can do something about, about your condition on your own if you don't use it. Right. Maybe it makes it easier for works to creep to creep in to the picture. Yeah, that's good. We won't love price nearly as much. You just gave the example of these two guys on the desk want a huge amount, want a smaller amount, and right. decide to give them both. Who's going to love them more? The one with the bigger debt. If we think our debt is this small amount, we're not going to love them very much. Right. Right. That's good. I think when we come to the point where we recognize sin for what it is and see sin as God sees sin. We know that there's no hope, no other hope than through him and cry out to him for, for mercy, for right. salvation. Until we get to that point of recognizing it for what it is, uh, we'll never understand that. Right. Right. Yeah. E even the phrase like crying out to God to be saved. Like, Why would I need to do that if I'm I'm okay? I just you know I sin sometimes. You know. You know. There's no desperation there. Uh, Talked about that last evening at our Bible study. That uh, with cults and all sorts of heresies, uh, they very seldom just outright deny Christ and the cross. But it's always an add-on. Always an add-on. And it's Christ plus plus works. It's Christ plus whatever. And that's how it. It's one of the ways that this infiltrates into every other um, aspect of the you know, Christian doctrines. Right. Mm -hmm. It does infiltrate. Anything else? Anything else? All right. It's a, it's a very vital doctrine and lots of doctrines sort of ride on it. Um, Does total depravity of nature mean that an unsaved person cannot do anything good? You have to find your standards of what is good. Um, you know, are that good compared to what uh, what another person does? You know, like you can say a dog is a good dog, but if a person did the same things a dog did, that be depravity. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but good, good is in relation to God, not out of it. Out of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, what type of good, if any? They may do some very nice things for society and become as good as society. But even as it says in Isaiah 64 6, that even our righteousness is. Are still the before God. So the things we do, say a person does some things in society thinks that's a good thing, and, uh, and yet they're doing it out of pride or you look upon maybe for a tax break or something like that instead of doing it with the heart that's right. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that Isaiah 64 6 says even the good that we do, this, there's evil present with it. Mm -hmm. It does come down to the motive that. You have to do the whole way down to the very bottom tip of the for everything, for the motivation of everything you ultimately do. And the things that we do that appear good, I may want to do good, something good for my child, but if you <coughs> dig down deep enough, uh, you always have some sort of a, a, an alternative motive. It, it, it all only benefits me if my child succeeds compared to the few things. Um, it's, we're able to peel that onion away. There's always something that benefits us or makes us look good. Or it's, it's, beyond, it's just beyond us to understand God is totally good. He has no other motivation other than holiness. Dig down to the very bottom tip of our roof. There's always something there for our benefit. Right. That's good. Anything else? So, yes, the answer is no. 
and yes. The answer is no, they cannot do anything pleasing to God. They are unable to do so, it says in Romans 8 and elsewhere. Um, completely unable to do so. But uh, is there outward uh, societal good that they can do? Sure. Um, in, in other words, can a pagan uh, love their child? Well, sure. You know, we're going to all acknowledge that on some level uh, that's the case. Um, and, and other things like that. Um, so, so we're not saying that, again, everyone who is not a believer is as, possi- is as bad as they possibly can be outwardly. What we're saying is inwardly their hearts are hard and corrupt. Um, and they do not acknowledge God as they are. Does that make sense? So on some sort of outward level we can acknowledge uh, societal goods, familiar goods in, in some sort of ways. Um, you can even admire uh, the bravery or courage of a uh, unbeliever in battle or something like that. Okay, uh, But we know all their good deeds are as, right, are as uh, filthy rags to the Lord. For their hearts are hard and far from it. Alright, what is the modern attitude toward the doctrine of total depravity? Don't tell me that. <laughs> right. What? There's, no good. There's a little good and a little bad in everyone. You just hope at the end you have more good than bad. Right. Kind of the general perception. It's true. Mm-hmm. Is they uh, start redefining what is bad? Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, yeah. Years ago, you think, you know, I'm old fashioned. <coughs> you, you think of how the rules have changed. Mm-hmm. You know, I can go back when well, it was unheard of for someone to do this, but now well, it's okay to do that. Because mm-hmm. now you say it's not so bad. Right. It's not really bad. Right. It's calling the evil good and the good evil. Yeah. yeah. And, and often they do it just by switching. Uh, the name around, you know. Instead of calling a, a murder, murder, they call it abortion. Right? There's a, they put a nice title on it and it doesn't sound as bad. You know? There's things, different things like that. Yeah. Or self defense. Well, well, there are valid cases of self defense, but you know, it could, that could be the case yeah, in certain cases for sure. He didn't really murder him. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that there's a. Uh people are inherently good and if there's only a few bad people out there or you know it's really from working from the outside and not from the inside out you know this person's like this because their parents or mm-hmm. because society or because they didn't have education or what have you not that their nature is inherently corrupt right yeah everything today is 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 there's a biological reason or a psychological reason why that's taking place. So everything is, there's a physical answer to that. And, uh, you know, it's not his fault because, you know, he has the alcoholic gene, you know. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're right. We, we tend to just think, you know, outwardly in that way. That's a good point. There's also a lot of hostility towards this. I've come across mm-hmm. a lot of people that are very hostile towards the doctrine of total family. And, uh, the offense of the cross is something that they think about inflations what do you think man, that this this bad they can't earn my way into heaven there's, there's just this modern notion that uh, we're good enough to, to be kind of sinners mm-hmm. it is very offensive so <coughs> it's a yeah. question for our time yes it is it's it's an an yeah mm-hmm. right but it's very offensive it is to, to the person that's not subject to Christ mm-hmm. yeah it's a it, you can tell often it's like a stench to them, and they're just disgusted with it, with the, with the idea that they're not uh, good. <laughs> I was thinking also, Nick, that famous book that was out years ago by the rabbi, Why do Bad Things Happen to Good People? I mean, that's really the attitude of society. We're right. not unjust for allowing anything bad because we're all good. Mm-hmm. That's good. Right. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can't quite wrap our minds around. Uh, the fact that God is completely just and he doesn't owe anyone grace at all. 
It's not owed. Everyone's going to get what they deserve, you know. Um, when I hear someone say this recently, um, I think it was Dr. James White who said, uh, you don't want fairness. No. You want mercy. <laughs> what a good point, you know. People are always, why, why is God not fair? God's not fair. Oh. <laughs> He's merciful. <laughs> Yeah. It's like a guy I went to the photographer, right? The lady said, uh, no, do me justice. Or no, she said, do me justice. And he said, uh, maybe you don't need justice, you need mercy. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. That, uh, this, this reminds yeah. me of some, some conversations I've, I've seen in some interviews where people will try to get down to uh, getting some pagan to admit that there are bad people. And, you know, and so they'll pick Hitler or some you know, crazy extremist as an example. And sometimes they won't even condemn Hitler because I guess they know if there is, there is a standard, if there is justice, then it can apply to them too. And so they don't even want to condemn people like that, mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. In, in some places, unbelievers are getting more consistent, which is a scary thing. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yes, it's um, one thing I have written here is is pride. Is 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 pride. Pride really comes out. Pride's really kind of the root of the issue uh, here. When you tell someone about total depravity, uh, the modern attitude is just to react in pridefulness. What are you talking about? I'm not like this guy over here. Are you kidding me? Uh, what practical lessons may we learn from the doctrine of original sin and total depravity? Practical lessons uh, about our hearts, about how we deal with sin, um, etc. It tells us we need a new federal head in Christ. All in Adam, all in our act, you know, which leads to our actual transgressions. We need a new Adam. Who's righteousness, uh, Pharisees, all of us, and, you know, so who, who, who deals with our sin. Right. Good. Yeah. We, you know, and that implies we can't do it on our on our own. That implies that we need a new representative. Right. Good. What else? It's a. Uh, you have to throw out the scale of justice. It's all or nothing. Proposition. Either we have good and we've done something, or we're going to be the prayer. We can rely on nothing but mercy. It is an all or nothing proposition. We can throw out the scale. Well, a good outweighs like that. Mm -hmm. Right, that's good. Yeah, that's, that's really the whole uh, book of Galatians. Right? You can't, can't have it both ways, you foolish Galatians who has bewitched you. <laughs> Yeah, good. Another, what another point on this is that the reminder that we as individuals, we can't earn our own salvation. We're totally depraved. We can't do it on our own. And that applies to you know, addiction and daily working through our sin. A reminder that we need the moving of the Spirit and we need, we need God and to remind ourselves of what Christ gave us. And so individually too, not just in like the general scope of salvation, but as we're being saved more and more each day, it's it's God, not us. That's really good. Yeah. So so many of us think we are saved by grace through faith, and this holiness sanctification thing is by works. <laughs> not exactly. Uh, if you want to, you can turn to. If I can find it, yes, uh, Acts twenty six. Which makes this clear. This is a very good point. We need the Spirit each and every day. That's really Paul's point as well in Galatians chapter 3, where he's condemning the Galatians uh, and he, the churches of Galatians. He's saying, 
Did you, you think you've begun by the Spirit and now you can just pick it up the rest of the way on your own? <laughs> you have to, you begin by the Spirit and you finish by the Spirit. It's all by the Spirit, right? Um, and this wonderful phrase here is used in Acts 26, starting in verse, um, let's just start at verse 16. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. It's that wonderful phrase, sanctified by faith in me. Sanctified by faith. We are in need of the Spirit in everything that we do. So that, that is a really good point, uh, Joshua. Um, another thing for this question, one implication is, is that uh, reforming outwardly is, is simply just snipping the weeds. You have to pull out the roots. You have to. Because the roots are, uh, the issue is your heart. The issue is your heart. You need a heart. You need a heart change, right? Uh, and even as a believer, and God has taken a heart, heart of stone, given you a heart of flesh. There's remaining sin within you, and there's there's roots down there that have to be completely mortified, put to death, is what that word means. So you have to completely mortify those sins and get to the get to the root. Sometimes when we're confessing sin, we're just thinking of the thing you did, right? The Puritans remind us. Don't just think about the thing you did that you have to confess, although you, you confess that particular sin. But get, get lower than that. Get deeper than that. Why did you commit that sin? What other sin led you to that sin? Confess that one too, right? And then slowly get to the root, okay? Um, so, something, okay, so you're telling me in confession it's this long process I should slowly think and think about my sin, think about your sin. That can lead to some depression, etc., because you're just looking inward. The Puritans would remind you, for every time that you, although this wasn't a Puritan who said this, but the sentiment is true. For every time you look inward, you look a thousand times to Christ. So yes, mortify your flesh, get deeper at the root of the sin to confess that. But look to Christ a thousand more times. Don't stay down there, or you'll just be a morbid, you know, human being. Because it's dark down there. And you need the light of Christ. Alright. Is it possible for a person to save himself? This is a, this is a giveaway question. Sorry. It was, a, it was in the it was, a, it was in boss. You know. um, it is, po- is it possible for a person to save himself from his condition of original sin and total depravity? No. <laughs> Say it with me. May it never be. God forbid. Jeremiah 13, 23, which most of you probably know, or if not all of you. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Then also you can do good who are accustomed to do evil. And therefore, like Joshua pointed out, we need the Spirit of God. And... and and don't think we're talk, don't simply think we're talking about other people because we are saved. We're talking about ourselves as well. We still need the Spirit to grow and to be sanctified by faith in Christ. All right. Any other comments or questions? All right. And how God trying to get to the root of sin if you feel like you're totally depraved, okay, I, I, you know, you're going to get to a point where you say, that's my nature, okay, forgive me, okay, give me some guidance as how I can not do that. Right, well, right, I mean, that's sort of the point. You, you, want, you, want to know, you want to know what's at the root of your sin so that you can confess that particularly, right? And, and not just snip at the snip at the weed. So, so for example, if I'm um, if if I'm confessing anger, right? 
But then I think about it and I think, okay, I was angry because this brother confronted me on something that he was right to confront me about. Right? And so I go deeper, I go deeper. The root might be pride, right? But for a year, I might just be confessing anger. Right? Uh, but I'm not really acknowledging that I'm prideful. So I, I don't know what remedy to, to give to that. Because I don't actually know the sin. Does that make sense? So once you, oh, I'm prideful. You can confess that, and you can talk to the, bro- the brothers, right? I'm prideful, I need help, I don't know, you know. You can search the scriptures, etc. But now you know the root of that particular sin. And, you know, there's more roots, but, but that's sort of what I'm getting at. Yeah. Uh, total depravity also emphasizes the fact that he'd be totally dependent upon God to be able to serve him correctly. We cannot produce anything. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with that said, that the life of total dependency is a life of maturity Christian because it's not you doing it, it's Christ in you. And I think that the, the, as you mentioned, it's the time we come to Christ depending totally on Him, because we understand we're totally correct, then we try to work out our salvation on our own strength. Mm-hmm. Really, like I heard this preacher this past week talk about the fact that Christians today talk about commitment. And, you know, I'm guilty of it too, talking about being committed to the Lord. For the Bible doesn't speak to that. It talks about dying. Mm-hmm. Right. We come as we're dead. We're helpless. Mm-hmm. So then you, that's when you know that re- anything happened because the power of the resurrected Christ is right there in you. That's good. Right. Yeah. What you said about uh, it's not about the, the anger that is a real root of the real problem is pride. It's like that even with the manslaughter, the ignorance of the law is no excuse. So it is with God. There's no place in Scripture where we're like, well, he didn't know, so we'll give him a pass on that. It really is, that is what sanctification really is about. Walking down that hard gravel road with briars on both sides that are hanging over it. It's painful mm-hmm. to be able to get to those type of levels. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and through all of it, we have to be praying for the Spirit's help. For with, apart from the Holy Spirit, you can't be sanctified. You know? um, and apart from the Spirit, that just becomes some sort of moralism, right? Where um, you know, self-help apart from the Spirit. That's what sanctification looks like. Sanctification has to be with the Spirit, or it isn't sanctification.